Hey everybody, good evening. This is Isaac Curry. I wanna welcome you to the No Regrets Singles and Relationships Conference. Listen, uh, if you were here yesterday, you know that we had uh, some warfare, some technical difficulties, and we were unable to provide for you uh, the No Regrets uh, session that we wanted to provide for you. But here's the thing, we had a chance to pray with you, we had a chance to cover you and to intercede for you, and there are absolutely no accidents. But on tonight, it's six o'clock right now, Central Standard Time, we're able to provide for you a double feature. So on tonight, I have the privilege to present to you my brother, Dr. Aldewan Tart, who comes from Georgia. He's gonna speak on the subject, uh, the emotionally healthy relationship. And then there's going to be a very brief break. I'm going to come back. I'm going to speak to you and I'm going to introduce you to our second and final speaker for the evening, Pastor Kim Pothier, who is going to speak from the subject, um, the anatomy of letting go. And so these two are going to bless us on this evening. Uh, go ahead and hit the like button. Go ahead and hit the love button. Um, let us know you're here. Let us know where you're coming from, where you're tuning in from. I know that we have Kenya, Africa in the house, New York, other places in the city and state of Tennessee. Um, let us know where you're coming from. Let us know where you're tuning in from. Go ahead and hit the like button uh, on this Facebook page. If you're on YouTube, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. We want to know you're here so you'll know when I'm dropping more content. We're excited that you're here. We get two speakers on tonight who are going to bless us. I'm going to go ahead and move out of the way. My brother, who is a psychologist and a relationships expert, is going to speak to us tonight from the subject, the emotionally healthy relationship. Hear ye him. Hit that like button. Hit that love button. Let's tune in. I am the might before the sword, the tremors in the spear shaft. I craft my ways from blazes of firestorms, absorb the failings of deadened ends to render the floors I dance upon. I am the spaces between applause, the roars of hearts running through heaven's halls. I breathe the forms of light and silence, stall the course of cosmic riots. I am the glory of the giants Manasu, Sagomatha, Watchmen of the Asian plains, they yield my name. Made famous through the cries of albatross flocks, inflamed in Pacific fires. I am dressed in the spray of Nevada dunes, clothed in the shadows of Sahara caves. I am the light of lunar flames, fleshing the rains of Amazonia. I paint the trains of Antarctic quests, Release dominion to desert panthera. I authorize the remains of Aztec and Inca that bloom through the visions of mountain tribes. I ride the skylines, breathe the signs, ignite the paths of astronomy's eyes. I am the unheard, heard in the storms that burn on my words. I am the yearned for. I am the word. I emerge deciduous from the wetlands of your cries, rise through the moments you wake. I bring the dawns that shake the fevers from your remembrance. I am here. I am imminent. I am he who crosses the plains through which you strayed. Discover the parts extinction seared. I dust away the dried remains of tears, drain the lakes of your regrets. I wet the wells, till the soil, forsake the toil, quell the rages, sow the broken pages with my belief in you. I bring the you you have never quite met. I am the desire that keeps your pillow wet. I am the heartbeat you seek when you chase after dreams. In the reachings and sighs you are looking for me. In the body touching body it is me you seek. In the groans and the longings it is me you seek. In the yearning dream, in the need to be seen. In the love me, love me it is me you seek. In the breath drop wonders, gasping hunger. In the 
touch of a stranger that makes you feel younger in the books and the fables in the this is me labels in the is this me is this me in the hear me hear me say my name in the touch me find me need me find me in the aching pain in the love the music the beats the taste in the heat and the need and the need for embrace in the color the gaze the meaning the desire in the flame of the voice and the spirit of the fire when you cry for more my name you weep i am he who waits for you to reach i reach for you and wait when you lie half broken and awake i am the watchman of your sleep i wait and wait till the shakings cease i am the truth they call release when the darkness flares and starts to speak i sculpt the shades of daybreak it is me you seek dr alduan tart is a psychologist minister speaker media host and author who appears frequently as an expert in his field on cnn and hln his youtube channel has garnered more than 1 million total views a graduate of Morehouse College, he is the youngest African American to receive his PhD in clinical psychology from the University of Michigan. In recognition of his dedication and excellence, Dr. Tart received an NAACP award for a lifetime achievement in empowering youth and families. He is the resident psychology expert for Radio One and appears regularly on the Ricky Smiley, Cafe Mocha, Willie Moore Jr., KD Bo, Darlene McCoy, and Frank and Wanda syndicated radio shows. Dr. Tart was co-host of Love Addiction on TV One and has appeared as a psychology expert on multiple national television stations. He is the author of The Ring Formula, How to Be the Only One He Ever Needs, contributing author of Saving Our Daughters, and has just released the best-selling Fix My Marriage System, an online masterclass that helps couples strengthen and repair their marriages. Dr. Tart manages a thriving psychology practice in Georgia, conducts marriage trainings across the country, is a licensed and ordained minister at Word of Faith Family Cathedral and is happily married with two beautiful daughters. His subject today is the emotionally healthy relationship, how to deal with communication, connection, and sexual issues while dating. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Tart. Good morning. Good morning. Y'all ready to have some fun? All right. I'm excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Pastor Curry. Thank you for the team. Thank you to Hope Memphis. I'm just excited to be here. This is probably the nicest church that feels like a living room I've ever been in in my life. <laughs> All right. Just feels like if I got into an argument with my wife, I'm just going to come here and sit on the couches. Just give me a little TV and I'm good. I am good. Well, I'm excited to be here. Let's go before the, the Lord in prayer. Lord God, thank you for having me here today, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the unique assignment that you've given me as a Christian psychologist, Lord, to be able to combine the faith and the works when it comes to dating, Lord. Dating right now as we're waiting to get into relationships. Dating right now, Lord, as we are dating and trying to figure it out, Lord. Dating right now and maybe being in something that feels dysfunctional and trying to find your way out, Lord. And being able to have the hope to find the right partner, Lord, to be able to have a healthy marriage. Not just any marriage, but a healthy, godly marriage, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for just assigning me, for to giving me this unique opportunity and the humility to serve God's people your way. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. All right. So, like I said, I bring you greetings from Atlanta, Georgia, home of the Atlanta Hawks, who are not in the playoff, just like the Memphis Grizzlies, so we can all cry. We can all cry. We can all cry. We can all tank together to get better draft picks. Okay, I'll leave that alone. All right. No, I often joke about that because God has done so many amazing things in my life is that one of the other things that I've been able to do is not only uh, preach, but also be a psychologist for the NBA. So I used to work for the Oklahoma City Thunder and still work for rookies around healthy relationships because it's hard no matter how much money you have, no matter what you're doing, relationships are hard. So I am excited to be here today. Now, when I was backstage... I heard the title. I was like, how am I going to talk about all that in 45 minutes? 
45 minutes. All right, but so praise be to God, we're going to get there because one of the things that is important is that we learn how to do relationships. All right, so let's start with our foundational scripture, which is 2 Kings 38 41. 38 41. 2 Kings 38 41. All right, let me know when you have it, and then we're going to dive in. I just love it when God gives you a word. And I'm excited about having navigated the single scene and then being married and then having daughters so I can see the whole 360 degrees. Because I'm going to tell you all, dating is hard. Anyone, can anyone? Dating is hard. How many of you believe that being a Christian does not keep you away from dating problems? How many of you believe that? <laughs> How many of you believe that being a Christian and dating another Christian does not stop you from having issues? All right. Being a Christian does not stop you. If anyone taped you on YouTube in your worst moments from seeming psychotic and insane, anyone? Right. I'm so glad I grew up when there was no social media. Oh, my goodness. Some of the things that I've said and done, I would be embarrassed today. I'd be embarrassed. All right. All right. 2 Kings 38 through 41. And I'll read. It says, Elisha. Oh, 2 Kings 38 through 41. Oh, oh, hold on, hold on. Let me get myself together. Let me pull my word up. Hold on, hold on. They're like, what kind? All right, hold on. All right. Oh, man, like, what kind? of minister y'all bring up in here. Good <laughs> God, what in the world did y'all do? Oh, man. I would blame this on my receptionist, but she had nothing to do with this. <laughs> Second Kings 4, 38 and 41. I just wanted to see if y'all were real Christians. You know what I'm saying? That's what that was. Pray for me. Pray for me. That's the worst thing that happens. 2 Kings 4, 38 through 41. All right, all right. Man, I know y'all, I know. Reverend Curry was like, this is bad already. All right. <laughs> it's not good. It's not good. All right. All right. 2 Kings 4, 38 through 41. Elisha returned to Gilgal, and there was a famine in that region. While the company of the prophets was meeting with him, he said to his servant, put on a large pot and cook some stew for these prophets. One of them went into the fields to gather herbs and found wild vine and picked as many gourds as his garment withhold. When he returned, he cut them up into a pot of stew, though no one knew what they were. The stew was poured out for the men but as they began to eat it, they cried out, man of God, there is death in this pot. Now, no laugh. I know some of y'all laughing because maybe y'all have someone that can't cook. That's not, not the point here. All right. And they could not eat it. Elisha said, get some flour. He put it in the pot and said, serve it to the people to eat. And there was nothing harmful in the pot. Now y'all saying, what does that have to do with dating? What does that have to do with dating? All right? Absolutely nothing. Now I'm playing, I'm playing. All right. Now here's the thing, is that when it comes to dating and relationships, we've heard a lot of things on TV, heard a lot of things in the world, but when we've, have you ever gone out and, and dated and felt like you had bitter stew or had a bitter relationship? Have you ever been in a relationship, you say, I want something godly, and then you get into it, and then you've been burned so many times in relationships, you have an idea of marriage and relationships now that's turned you bitter. Well, it's right here in the Word. So Elisha is a prophet, and he's meeting to the prophets because we know that the Word is a living Word. This manna is current. This is a time when they were worshiping false gods. It says there were 7,000 that resisted false gods, 7,000. And these were the prophets. These were people in seminaries. These were people that were prophets that were trying to teach the right way to do life, which we know is God. And so he sent this 
So he went out to go feed the people, and when he came back, what he fed them was actually poison. It was bad. How many of you have ever dated and it was a bad experience? Don't raise your hands, just wink. Just, just tap your toe. If you're with that person right now, be real still, be real still. Don't say anything, don't look to the right or the left, just stay in the spirit. And you're like, ooh, I knew God told me to come for a reason. Oh my goodness. It's bitter. You ever got into an argument and they say things and they use things about your past and it makes you feel worse being in the relationship than when you were? Before you were single, you were lonely, but at least they were ignoring you. <laughs> you ever had someone, you know, say, all right, I'm going to bed. I'll talk later, I'm tired. Five minutes later, you see them on social media. <laughs> like, how you tired if you comment on social media? <laughs> Little things hurt our heart. All right, but what the, the, the point here is that God knows how to make relationships work. And when they went and they added flour to the bitter stew, and, and what, what key ingredient does flour make? Bread. And what does the word of God call? Bread. And so it is saying, get some flour. He put it in the pot and serve it to the people to eat. And there was nothing harmful in the pot. So today we're going to learn how to make our relationships healthier. We're going to get past bitterness because we have to learn what to do. God's word, there is a right way and a wrong way to do relationships. And we have learned all the wrong ways. Sometimes our parents have shown us the wrong way. We did not see a functional marriage growing up. Or like me, I saw a functional marriage, but I never saw my parents work through problems because they always went upstairs. Maybe that's how my little brother got here. I don't know. I don't know how these things work. <laughs> but I know when I got married, I was like, I, I, I started doing stuff I saw on TV. Girl, you're not going to talk to me like that. <laughs> I, I, just, I don't know where this stuff, anyone with me, I don't know where this stuff comes from. I don't know where these words come out of my mouth, things that I do. I'm just not going to talk to her. She looks at me, I'm not going to look at her. If we have a silent treatment and she doesn't talk to me for four hours, I'm not going to talk to her for eight. That's what a man is supposed to do. I just, you get it? I mean, we don't know what we're doing. We have no idea what we're doing. We're just doing what we're doing, and it's making the process bitter. So the point is, is that one of the things that the world is doing is trying to contaminate and steal our mind. The devil is a roaming lion. He wants to steal our mind. He wants to get to you now because this is the best time for him to discourage you. If he can get to you right now, it's easier than having him get to you in a relationship, in a marriage, because then you already have that commitment. If you've gained some grit, some resiliency, some staying power, you've had some good times. If he gets to you right now, he can discourage you to where you say you don't even want to marry. We're in a generation right now where the average kid says, I don't know if I really want to marry. All right, because I didn't see mom get married. I didn't see dad get married. And you're telling me that I have to grow up. This is what they say. I have to grow up and never have sexual relations? I may never get married. So why wait? Why abstain for something that's never going to happen? I mean, that's, that's attacking. That's, that makes rational sense. The devil is crafty. So first thing I have to do is sell you on why you should get married. That's the first bit of flower. It's, it's a book called Happier. It says having people who care who we care about and who care about us, who we share our world with, increases our happiness. It's right there. It says, uh, uh, Dr. David Meyer says, there's few stronger predictors of happiness than a close, nurturing, equitable, intimate, lifelong companion with which to share our world. It's right there. How many of you are relational? How many of you want a travel partner? You want someone to talk with? You want someone to connect with? You want them to actually, I want my wife to actually listen to me about how I think the Hawks can make the playoffs next year. She don't even know who on the team. She don't even know. All right? But I want, I, want, I want her to listen to that. And she wants me to listen to some show. How many of y'all have a show? All right? My wife has a show on Netflix called The 100. Y'all heard of that? Yeah, The 100. Yeah. She keeps telling me about these episodes. But I have to act like I care. <laughs> oh, what happened? And I start watching. I'm like, but this is stupid. She's like... Now, I say anything about the Hawks, you know, they losing. That's terrible. Why don't you pick a winning team like Golden State? Steph Curry, I know him. 
You know, my wife is real funny. I told her who my favorite hawk was. He's been traded, but her favorite hawk was Jeremy Lin. And she looked at him, she was like, an Asian guy? I mean, there's nothing wrong with him. I'm just, just trying to figure out. I was like, no, he's a super Christian. Oh, man, he had this book. I talked to him for like 25 minutes about this book. That's why I love my wife, because I know she wasn't a bit more interested in, <laughs> all right? <laughs> but let me stay focused. The whole goal here is what if, we, what if God wants us to learn how to do relationships before we get into them? What if the whole point right now for the scripture and what he's given to me to give to you is so that we can learn how to do relationships before they turn bitter? How to do it? Because what we know, y'all, is the divorce rate is 50% even in the house. Even inside the kingdom is 50%. But here's what you don't know. It's 35% for first marriages, 65% for second plus marriages. 65 percent that's two out of three why because we don't know we still have that bitter stew we're still taking our stuff into the next relationship they're taking their stuff and we don't know how to do it god's way we just don't know we know what to do we don't know how to do and that's what we're going to talk about today all right so what's breaking relationships Can someone tell me what do you think what's the main thing killing relationships yes sir love of money communication Trust, fear, intimacy, selfishness, social media. We're going in. I can stay right there. If I wasn't prepared, I just keep asking y'all questions, all right? All right. All, all of those things are correct. The main thing is that all of those things break down connection. What happens on this cell phone had I not been able to get connection to find the right scripture? All right, someone would have had to come up here and say, brother, here's an old school Bible, which you should have. You millennial, okay? Have a real Bible and you'd have it right there, okay? With no connection, we don't have anything. We can have all the money in the world. We can have all, all the, the, the things on paper. But if we don't have connection, if I'm not feeling you, if you don't feel me, we don't have anything. And what we know is that our God is the God of connection. We know that when Paul was assigned to preach the gospel, it's interesting that he had a formula. What he did was he preached, he preached to a beachhead of Christians. So he did something like this. He preached to who, who would come around. He would preach to them. But then the next thing, what would he do? He grouped them. He grouped them together and then taught them more intensely. So we come to church. We have a, we have. We have this Sunday service, but then we group you into discipleship groups, Bible study groups, so that we can grow stronger. And so what happens is when we don't have relationships, it's interesting that the Apostle Paul knew that he could teach people more intensely by grouping them together. So we are built to have relationships, but when that connection is gone, we don't have anything. Now, I want you to write this down. There is a winning formula for marriage, and it's rooted in Scripture, followed by psychology. Psychology follows scripture and it's connection say connection yes. plus conflict resolution plus, conflict resolution. plus, teamwork, plus teamwork, teamwork equals a lasting marriage so what we're going to talk about today is how to build connection because if you can't build connection you can't even begin to have a relationship it doesn't matter about the credit scores. It doesn't matter about the, the, trying to blend the families. It doesn't matter how funny they are, how attractive you are. It doesn't ma matter even about your character because you can have strong character and no relationship with anyone. There's no connection. So let's talk about how to build connection. What we call a psychologist is called love maps. Say love maps. Love. All right, and this is where you create a schedule daily, weekly, and monthly of getting to know the heart and the mind of the person whom you are dating. The whole goal of a first date, the whole goal of a first phone conversation is to get to know that person, all right? But if we didn't see that intimacy at home, if we didn't feel that from our parents, we, don't we can't necessarily assume that we know how to build intimacy. A lot of times we can go on dates and feel like it was good, but wonder why was nothing there? over and over again. Now, you're not going to have chemistry with everyone. Like, you know, I wasn't feeling Beyonce. All right, I had to let her go. Okay, I said, good, I'm not feeling you. All right, all right, I had to let her go. I'm not feeling you. That's what happened. That's how I broke down, okay? So, 
You're not going to have chemistry with everyone, but there are certain people that you would have chemistry if you knew how to connect, if you knew how to connect. And so what you want to do is that you want to love map. And so here's how you do it. You, you want, you will take the obvious. You have to date, say date, date. You can't Netflix and chill y'all. Not all the time. You have to date and do fun things. You, if you want to change the mind, you have to change what the mind sees. All right. And so if I want to get out of my world and I want to be excited, then we have to plan dates for things that we've never done or things that we wanted to do or things that stretch us so that we can have fun together and we can experience life together. That's what bonds us. Think about what's bonded you with your closest friends. Was it not experiences doing fun things, serving in ministry together, you know, cooking things that didn't taste good, like bitter stew, you know, you, that bonds you. We're taking you off the hospitality ministry. No, no food ministry. All right. So you have to have those rituals. And what we know is that couples that are able to talk and converse, talk and converse are able to connect. They're able to connect. What women want is conversation. They want conversation. Matter of fact, I'm going to take a little, I'm going to dive off a little bit. Um, There's a book called His Needs, Her Needs. I recommend that you, that you buy it. Here are the top five needs for women. All right. Women, tell me if this is true. All right. Men, I wonder how many of these you're going to get right. Okay, all right. Uh, affection, conversation, honesty and openness, financial support. I said yup, all right, all right. And family commitment. So they not only want us to be great husbands, but they want us to I mean to be great providers, but to be great husbands and fathers, son-in-laws, cousins, nieces, nephews. Deacons, they want us to be great family men. Those are the needs. So when we start talking about building love maps, it's about getting into your partner's world. So here's what I want you to do. Here's the practical advice. When you're on a date, I want you to try to figure out the three things that your partner wants to talk about and the three things that you want to talk about every day and talk about those things. So when married couples break down, we tell them, write down the three things you want to talk about. So for me, it would be the Atlanta Hawks. Okay. My wife would talk about the hundred. I also, I know I'm in church, but I know y'all watch TV as well. One of my favorite shows is True Detective. Oh, yes. Yes. How many of y'all just feel like crackheads when it keeps looping? Like you can't stop watching. Like I'm going to, I'm going to get up and study my word right after this next episode. Uh, eight hours later, I'm stinky in the bed. Like Matthew McConaughey is a great actor. I love him. Woody Harrell. All right. So but if she talks to me about that, here's the interesting thing. If she talks to me about True Detective, or I talk to her about the 100 or whatever it is, I'm actually interested in what's in her head and her heart. We are connecting. We are bonding. It's not rocket science. And so when you're dating and you're asking each other and you're checking in with one another, now you're building intimacy. And that's how you go from total strangers to having something. It's not about the superficial. It's not about the credit score. Not about the height. Have you ever, and, and most women say they weren't attracted to their husbands. A husband says, girl, I knew you were going to be the one as soon as you walked in. You know, and the woman was like, God, this what you send me? This right here? It don't look anything like the picture. Oh my goodness. This is not it. Fake news, fake news. Fake news. <laughs> fake news. All right, let me keep going because I'll have fun with you all. I want to be on time. It says, oh, uh, what's it say in the, in, in the word? Psalm 139. I'm not going to read all of it. It says, oh, Lord, you search me. and You know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You understand my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down. You are aware of all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, you know all about it, oh, Lord. If we're to have relationships that are modeled in God's likeness, we need to get to know one another. And what we know from the research is that is a daily process. It has, you have to have a schedule for dating. It can't be random. It can't be. When I was dating my wife, one of the things I learned about her was that she was a fitness competitor. All right? So I was like, Lord, you know I want to go into ministry later. All right? Because I was still in the club. I, I didn't want to be a club preacher. Mainly because I didn't want y'all looking at me. I'm not saying anything is wrong with it, but I wanted to do the club fully. We're not just saying, isn't that pastor sign over there? It's 3.30 in the morning. Man, I, I wasn't ready for that, all right? I, I wanted to be done with the club and then be a deacon, all right? Just, yeah. 
All right. But anyway, so I was like, Lord, you know, I want to go into the ministry. Why would you send me a wife that's a fitness competitor? It's showing all the stuff, posing, all this kind of stuff. I'm like, I said, so I told her I want to go into ministry later. And she said, all right, that's cool. I'm a Christian. I'm in my word. I'm strong. I said, but girl, you can't put all those pictures on the Internet. Are you posing and bikini and all this kind of stuff? She says, look, baby, if you get a church, that's going to be the strongest, finest church in the world. They all going to be looking like this. All right. <laughs> We're going to be working out. We're going to have a, I'm going to be able to fit this ministry, all right? We're going to have a good time. All right, but what I learned when I went deeper in understanding my wife is that the working out and the fitness was not about the superficial. Her mom had a heart attack at 32. She's living. Hold on. All right, but my, my wife was scared of that, and so she's the anxious type, and so working out calms her down. It calms her down, and she likes competition, and it gives her focus, and it helps her with self-discipline. So one of the things that you have to make sure that we're doing is we get to know each other because we don't know each other. We have these judgments of people. We make them so quickly. Your credit score is a 300? <laughs> but you don't know, you know, his mama messed up his credit, okay? His mama messed it up. He came to the rescue. He had a 780, and then he put all mama stuff on there. That's what messed it up. He knew what he was doing. All right, let me keep moving, all right? So just a quick note, when you're dating and when you get married, you have to have as many rituals as you can. You need to have a ritual for leaving the house. You need to have a ritual for coming back in. You need to have a ritual for meal times. You need to have a ritual. We have an after dinner tea that my wife and I do when we sit down and we talk and my wife goes through Instagram and tells me the events of the day. That's what she likes. Don't laugh. Hey, either I can look at, the, look at her, look at the phone, or I can say, what's in the phone? That's, that's that you ignore me. Jesse Small leg got off. What are you talking about? That's crazy. Let me see that. I said, watch. I bet Trump go get him. See, I told you. I told, I told you. I, I, it's like a soap opera. I told you. Let me keep going. The biggest thing that you can do, the biggest thing that you can do is that you can, the biggest thing that bonds people, we think, we thought it was going through a loss together. But what we know through the research is the biggest thing that bonds people is triumph, celebrating wins. So if you get a promotion, you lost some weight, you've gained some weight, something happened good in your life, celebrating that bonds you together. So make sure that you build rituals in your relationship. Why? Because a lot of married couples are struggling with being roommates. They're married, but they're single. They don't believe in divorce, but they're single as they come. All right? And so what they've learned is to go half on the bills, half on the children, you know, half on the cooking, right, but they don't talk. And we've learned to use these things to keep our attention. All right, I can watch ESPN all night, be good. She can watch nine episodes of 100 and, and be good. And so we have too many distractions. Back in the day, you know, my, my people are from Alabama. My, my grandparents used to sit on the porch and talk for two hours. And beep, 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 hey, that's cousin, hey, that's Fred from the police station. Hey, how can you tell from the car? Oh yeah, 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 the kid's going, yeah man, the kid has cerebral palsy. Yeah, they know everything. They talk, they converse. All right, second thing I want you to do, Connection Builder, is appreciation. Appreciation. What you have to do inside of your relationship, this is how you secure a relationship. Have you ever been in a relationship and you felt insecure, like you're not sure, I'm not sure that they're feeling me? You're not sure, all right? You, you have to have that. When I was dating my wife, at this time I had this show on BET, y'all. I thought I was the man. I had a red carpet premiere, all this kind of stuff. Got home, and I'm not going to lie because I'm going to be honest. I knew I was going to get a kiss. I was like, she's going to think I'm the man. I, I, this kiss is coming. I'm already excited about it. I'm already thinking about General Hospital. You know, just how you learn how to kiss, looking at soap barbers. I don't know about y'all, all right? Because I didn't see my parents do that. They didn't do that in front of my face. Watching General Hospital and watching Prince. And purple rain, oh, that's how you do it. Oh, you take your little finger in the hand and push the palm. Okay, I'm going to do that. I'm going to try that, all right? And when I got home, y'all, when I got home, this is like the sixth, seventh day, I, know, I knew when I went in for the kiss, she said, Rrr. she swerved me. And I said, you know, I can, take, I can take you not interested, but this guessing is killing me. If you're not feeling me, just let me know. She said, listen, Aldewan, you know, I am feeling you, but I'm like a flower. It takes time for me to open up. I don't know if that was game, but I was like, girl, where the water? Where's the water? How much water do I need? Whatever, whatever you want to do. Agua, whatever you want to do. What language do you want it in? All right? And what she was telling me was keep chasing, keep pursuing, which made me focus on her. But what I needed to know was, are you feeling me? And so she shared appreciations. You're consistent. You do this. You're ambitious. That's all I needed to hear. 
The kiss for me was an affirmation. It was appreciation. And so what we have to do is that we have to verbalize three appreciations when we get into relationships a day. Y'all like, that's kind of needy. <laughs> We're needy. We don't like to admit it, but men, I'm, you know who's the neediest? Men. All right, I, one time I took the trash out. I, I came home, I, you know, I came home, I said, mm. Took trash out, babe. You know, he kind of fished for compliments. I took trash out. It was raining out there. It was wolves. It was raining. It was gunfire. <laughs> Tsunami. It was, everything was going. Girl, in this marriage, you never have to touch the trash. Never. Trash, I do. Girl, you spoiled. You spoiled. And she looked at me and said, what you want, a cookie? I was like, yeah, actually. Because before you met me, you took your own trash out. I know plenty of women that would love me to take trash out. All right? Let me get on Instagram, all right? All right. So I needed, so I needed her to say, babe, thanks for taking the trash out. Now, that's a silly story, but the research shows that's how much affirmation that we need. So what you want to do is when you get into a, a relationship, a committed relationship, Three appreciations a day, every day. Baby, I appreciate you letting me listen to my favorite song on the radio. I appreciate when my mom came over and started talking about the greens. You didn't say anything. You let her doctor the greens, even though they were salty than a mug. Okay, you let her do it. All right? Hey, and, and when, you know, my dad came over, you talked to him about the weather for an hour. I appreciate that. All right? You don't even look at the weather report. I, I appreciate that. All right? And so what we know is that and, and this is based in scripture. It says, Proverbs 16, 24, gracious words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul, healing to the bones. Roman 12, 10, be devoted to one another in love, honor one another above yourselves. It's right there. And so part of what's ruining our connection is that we're getting into relationships and we're not requiring these type of conversations as part of the culture we're just building a culture of appreciating one another because if I'm sharing a meal with you, we're doing something, I think the appreciations, I just don't verbalize them. I can tell everyone what I like about you, but you've never heard it. But you know what, though? I'm quick to complain. You don't open the door for somebody? What kind of man are you? What kind of woman that doesn't cook? What, what, kind of, what, kind of, what kind of man, when the bill comes, you look at me? I mean, who does that? Who wears that? What's going on, girl? This is 2019, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> all right. So, all right, third thing. All right, so the first thing you want to do, just, just to recap, is that you want to have rituals for connection. You want to date. You want to spend time. You want to love map. Get into their head and their heart daily. Then you want to appreciate them. You want to share fondness and admiration. Validate them. Some of us have never heard that from our parents. We've gone a whole, a whole year without someone validating. You think I'm funny? You think I'm smart? You think I'm witty? And who are we to be Christians in a relationship and not to talk about that? All right? So you have to be able to do it. Third thing you want to do is you want to attach and support. When someone opens up their mouth and they talk, and they talk, you wanna to respond to that. They're asking for attention. And so when we're on our phones and we're on our social media and someone says, oh, it looks like it's gonna be a sunny day, and you say, mm. <laughs> all right, it was, how was work today? It was okay. Oh, okay, all right. We're not paying attention. Well, we really, we, we, hold on, hold on, it didn't seem okay. Is, are you sure everything's okay? See, in church we have this thing, how are you today? I'm blessed and highly favored. Your leg just broke off in the car. I mean, you still say, so I just duct tape it. And I don't have any medical insurance. <laughs> no, 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 no. We have to ask people how they're doing, really. So if we're going to be in a relationship, we have to respond to them. How are you really? I'm not well. I'm not well. I'm worried about my mom. She won't go to the doctor. I'm worried about my dad. I know he's lying about not going to the doctor. And I don't know how to get him to go because he shuts me down. That's what we signed up for in relationships, to be able to support one another. That's what it's all about. So we're not doing that. It says John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so we have to use words and connect and support with one another, and we have to be able to pray for one another, to be able to stand in the gap with one another. We're going to be in a relationship. It's about support. Now, the fourth thing you have to do is that you have to be a faithful giver. You have to be a giver in a relationship, not a taker. 
Just quick note, you know, some of us are so nice, and I'm going to talk about this in the afternoon presentation. Some of us are so nice, we give more than we receive. We give more than we require in relations. How many of you are helpers? How many of you are helpers? Raise your hand, helpers. All right? So helpers, I'm glad I'm in the right place. Y'all have issues. <laughs> we have issues. You know why? Because our calling car is I'll help you. You know, when I was dating, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with crack. Girl, I can fix that. I can pray. I can play hands. I can give you the psychology. I can get you into addiction. We, we, other people would let that go, but as a helper, we're like, I can help you. That's cool. And so what happens is when we don't require, when we don't have presence, when we don't have boundaries, when we don't have expectations, when we don't understand that we're God's son and daughter and that he doesn't want us in dysfunction, what we do is we say, you know what? I can be secure in this relationship because I can help you. So you're not going to leave me. I know you're on crack, LSD, and mushrooms, and you drink alcohol in the orange juice container. I know that, but I can pray over all that stuff, you know. I, I look past all of that instead of saying, hey, I like you, but we need to do, you need to do something. You need to go to Celebrate Recovery or AA. I can deal with you. I'm not judging you, but you can't bring that addiction into the relationship because then I'm in it, and now I'm going through it. So we have to make sure that we require. Here's, here's the combination that's going to shock you. And I want to talk about sex before we end, all right? Is if you are a helper, guess who you attract? People who need help. Oh, it's a dysfunctional marriage. It's a dysfunctional marriage you just attracted to, all right? Uh, if, you are, if you don't think enough of yourself, guess, guess who you attract? A narcissist. Donald Trump. All right, Kanye, we can go all around. All right, I can spread it around. Democrat, Republican, it doesn't matter. You can find them. All right. Oh, you're oh, you going to let me have the relationship the way I want to do it and you'll turn down? I, you always apologize, even though I'm wrong 70% of the time because you don't want to have alt against your neighbor? Woo! That's a great relationship. 99% about me and 1% about you. That's great. Let's do it. That's how we get into it. Does that make sense? So when we do that, we sign up for it. Instead of saying, no, helpers, say helpers, date, helpers. All right, that's, that's the word right there, okay? All right, so, and, I, and I, had, I had to do that because I was attracting women that needed help, and I was attracted to it. I couldn't separate the helper part of me from the relationship part of me, and there's a piece of me that likes drama. Girl, you want to cut me because you thought I was talking to another girl? <laughs> Your passion's so high, girl! Woo! That's love. That's love. Girl, you cuss me out like that? That's sexy. I'm, hey, I'm a psychologist for a reason. Golly. You ready to fight over me? I'm that fine? Ooh. But that's not good for me. I saw the sign. All right. All right. So here's the last thing. So we're going we're gonna to round this out. All right. Here's something I want you to get because I talked about dealing with sexual issues, you all, is that what we do is we mistake lust for real godly love. But we don't know why. Have you ever, and don't understand, have you ever just known, you just been in the spirit of lust and you know it's wrong and, and the scriptures come to mind, but you feel like you're driving into a brick wall, but you can't stop. You'd be like, get out, get out. Oh, this feels good. Get out, get out. No, don't do it. You stupid. Man, you stupid, 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 stupid. And you keep driving. Have, has anyone ever been there? You've been there, but you can't figure out what it is. Let me tell you what that is in the spirit so that you know how to unlock soul ties. Because part of what's happening is that we know, we know not to have premarital sex, but it feels so good. It feels a gap, and we don't know what it is. We don't know why we can't stop driving into the wall, even though we know Tyrone is no good. We know Rihanna doesn't want me. We know she doesn't want me. She just needs me right now, all right? So here's, here's how it works, all right? Here's the chemical soul tie, all right? There's five phases of sex, and I'm going to give you the chemicals that happen. One is initiation. When there's initiation, there's something that happens. You're like, oh, are you touching me? Are you looking at me? Or you have a thought that it could be dopamine burst into your system. So you have this rush of dopamine the same way you feel when you're tapping yourself on this dopamine. Second one is excitement. There's excitement. You feel excitement. Guess what that chemical is? Adrenaline. Adrenaline is pumping in your body. You're excited about what's going to happen. Are you stretching? You're getting ready. Boy, this is, whoo, I don't know what's going to happen. I know I shouldn't do this. This is sin, but I'm now feeling out of my mind. Number three, and then there's stimulation. You begin to touch. Certain things happen. Oxytocin. 
which we know when we're married, it produces the, the, the cuddling hormone. It keeps you bonded for six hours. Hour seven, you're going to be arguing, okay? All right, seven, <laughs> all right? Seven, which is, we're going to call it the promised land, okay? Y'all, y'all understand where I'm going? Yeah, get to the promised land, all right? Norepinephrine is produced, which is critical with memory formation, memory formation. That's why we can't break the tie to someone because you're trying to do right, but then you still remember that person from five years ago. They come up on Instagram, you'd be like, whoa, 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 get that out, but I can't. I can't because that norepinephrine has combined with dopamine, adrenaline, oxytocin. And then here's the last thing, relaxation that comes after you've been to the promised land. It produces endorphins. And what are endorphins? Painkillers. All right. So I so something that is bad for me feels so good and I can't walk away from it. God, God made sex for marriage. He wants us to have phenomenal sex without guilt, without soul ties. And if you're able to bond and you're able to have great connections and you're able to build connections that are strong, you're able to have self-discipline. Here's the key. You're able to have relationships that make you feel the same way through conversation, connection, and fun. And you're doing it on a regular basis. You find a decreased need for wanting to have lustful sex. A lot of times we say you shouldn't do it, but that doesn't help you not want to do it. All right. And what we know is that we run out of willpower. We run out of willpower. That's why I told Beyonce, get out of my room, girl. I want to meet with you at the church from the pastor. All right. We run out of willpower and we think that we're bad Christians. We think that we're bad Christians. And really, we haven't been equipped with the tools of having a connection so strong. The lust goes down because we're getting the same chemicals God's way. We're able to get on the phone and connect and do something fun, and I'm not even thinking about it. I'm not even thinking about being with that person because on Friday and Saturday nights when I get lonely, I'm out doing fun things, even with platonic friends, because we're having great conversation. For those of you that know, you know, the devil's playhouse is in loneliness. And when you're by yourself and you alone, because you can be single and not lonely. But what we know is that if you're not talking to anyone, and you're not talking to anyone, you answer any DM. You, you, know, you look at your phone like, no one texting me? Let me go ahead and like this picture. I know I shouldn't. But. <laughs> phone, you know, phone battery on 100. Two hours later, still on 100. No, that's not good. I need some text to wear that thing down. I need some attention. And so what we have to do is be real and realize that when Paul grouped people together, he knew that it would be harder to pick people off if they were grouped. See, it's easier to pick you off on Friday and Saturday nights if you're alone and no one's contacting you, no one's talking to you. No one even cares about the three things that you want to talk about. You will reach out. You'll reach out to that person that you have no business reaching out to. And so what we know is that God wants you to build godly, strong relationships. Don't we feel that? When we haven't been to church or we've been out of our prayer life, we just can't feel God. We know he's there intellectually, but we can't feel him. And so because we can't feel him, we just don't feel connected. And because we don't feel connected, we try to go fill up on things that are bitter stew. And that bitter stew is killing us because we're developing a culture and we are doing things that don't even work. The soup was bitter when they tasted it. It seemed like it was good when they were picking it, but once they had it, they realized it's, what everything that looks good is not good for you. But God knows what's good for you. So hopefully today you've learned we have to build connection. Say connection. Yeah. All right. You know that you have to surround yourself with friends, even if you're not dating, so that you're out on Friday and Saturday nights and, in, and interacting with the world, and that you now know what causes this, this soul tie so that you can ward it off by getting in relationships and having strong connections. All right? So when we do that, we're able to have emotionally healthy relationships. This is just the first part. And I'm going to definitely ask you to bring me back and give you the next two parts. All right. When you start doing connection, because that's what it's all about. When you connect to God, that's a strong thing. All right. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord God, we thank you. We magnify you. Lord God, we ask and pray that you intentionally bring relationships to your people. Relationships just with platonic friends. Relationships with people that have the same affinity to talk about different things. And be able to bring romantic relationships that allow us to feel on fire for you, Lord. To feel connected. To feel part of the vine, part of the branch. To have people that touch us, Lord. We need to feel touch. Allow us to be connected, Lord. Allow us to never feel lonely. We can be alone, but allow us to be in your spirit and know that we have people that are thinking about us. 
Allow us to be able to break through these bonds of, of mistrust, to be able to discern from your word, from your vision, not ours, Lord, that you discern who's a good person and allow us to at least taste and see that they might be a good person so that we have someone to share this world with, Lord. Allow us to be able to relax and know that we need people and that we're not, we're not consummate sinners on a consistent sinners that we need people allow us to be able to celebrate bond and connect lord we ask and pray that you bring people together in godly relationships break them from dysfunction and be able to feel your word at all times these things we ask in jesus name amen, amen. come on everybody let's put your hands together Everybody, let's show our appreciation for my brother, Dr. Aldewan Tart, for his message. Did it impact you? Did it speak to you? Did you take any notes? Let us know how you feel. Let's appreciate Dr. Tart. Go ahead and hit that like button. Show something in the comment section. Let us know how it impacted you. We thank him. We thank Dr. Tart all the way from Georgia, blessing us with the subject, uh, the emotionally healthy relationship. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you all who are tuning in. If you didn't get a chance to listen to Dr. Tart and you're just tuning in, this message, these series of messages will be up for 24 hours. They will be deleted out tomorrow, uh, which will be Friday. We want you to go ahead and uh, tune in. And if you didn't get a chance to hear it, hear it after this broadcast is over. I have the opportunity right now to introduce to you uh, Kim Pothier, who is going to be speaking from the subject, um, the anatomy of Lef letting go. She's going to bless us. If you haven't heard her before, she's a firecracker. We want to hear what she has to say to be able to speak to you where you are in your lives. Listen, after she finishes, it will be the end of session three and four. So we don't have to um, stay any longer. When this session is over with, we will be concluded for the night. I need you to listen to me right now. Everybody pause. Everybody pause. Listen, listen. On tomorrow, Friday night, we have Friday night live. You might not be a worship person. I don't know where you are, what your flavor is. I double dog dare you to give it 10 minutes of your time tomorrow. Tune in. We have worship from some of the greatest, most anointed people around this city who are going to bless us. Chris Williams, Darnell Harris, and many other vocalists from the city of Memphis will be blessing us with some dynamic worship. You need this in your own household. Tune in tomorrow, 7 o'clock. I can't wait. And you know that on Monday, we'll be concluding the conference. It's at seven o'clock. We're going to have a comedy hour and then we're going to have a, a panel discussion with all of the speakers and we're asking questions and getting answers. And I'm going to be online to be able to answer some questions that you might want to text as well. So listen, I'm going to get out of the way. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for being flexible. Thank you for being here. Hopefully, uh, Pastor Tart, I know, bless someone. Pastor Kim is about to bless someone. You all make sure you tune in, take notes. I look forward to engaging you. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening. Listen to Kim Pothier as she comes. Peace. Pastor Kim Pothier is returning for the second year to the No Regrets Conference. A visionary and CEO of world-renowned ministry called Conquering Hell in High Heels, Pastor Kim has an active social media following of over 2 million people. Serving around the world, our distinguished guest is one of the most highly sought speakers in our country. She and her husband Mark serve as co-pastors at the Church of the Harvest in Fayetteville, Georgia. Pastor Kim starred in Preachers of Atlanta on Oxygen. Her best-selling book is entitled Beautifully Broken. We look forward to her presentation today on the subject, The Anatomy of Letting Go. Please put your hands together for Pastor Kim Pothier. Hey, y'all. I sure do love y'all, man. I am so, I'm so excited to see it's grown. Y'all are fabulous. Look at your friend and say, girl, sir, come on, gentlemen. You got it going on. Tell them. Sometimes we just need to be reminded that we got it going on. We got it going on. So I get the honor. Thank you, Isaac Kareev, for letting me come. I'm sure I said that with my little swag, you know. It's probably curry. 
I, but I like that slang, you know, it makes it sound a little bit better. And all the other speakers are the flowers in here. I, I love the, oh, hey, booze and, and, and doctor over there. Hey, y'all know what's so cool is I'm talking about the anatomy of letting go. And when I was, when I was looking at the flyer uh, to come here, I started getting real excited because I bet you if we took a poll in this room, I would have all y'all beat with holding on to stuff. I would have, I got, I got baggage after baggage. And I, and I started looking at the flyers. I was coming here and y'all know, a lot of you know my story. And just five years ago, I was still at Bloomingdale's working, making $9 an hour, Bloomingdale's. And I was carrying so much baggage and I was trying to work through that baggage. And I was raised a preacher's kid and I knew how to shout. I knew how to fall on the floor. I knew how to shun da 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 you know what I'm talking about? But nothing was getting free off of me. In fact, I was meaner. I, I was the girl that was so, I, I, I got so many haters. You know how y'all do? I see y'all supposed sometimes, y'all like, oh, I got, everybody's jealous of me. I got haters. And, and I was telling myself that for so many years. And one day I realized God spoke to me in that real small voice. That's why you get so much chatter going on in your life. You can't hear God's voice, right? So when we walk around and tell from the floor up because we can't hear God's voice. And I was like, I got haters. And I heard God say, no girl, it's just cause you mean. <laughs> you ain't got no haters. You ain't got no, you ain't got it going on because you won't look in that mirror and own that I need some things broken off of me. And I'm gonna put in the work. See, we go to church, we come here every week we come into these kind of conferences, we pay great money, we get the best people to speak into our lives that have studied and gotten it together just for you. And yet there's this thing that is called detachment where we detach from reality. See the wound that you are hiding inside of you, wondering how come we keep getting into relationship with relationship with relationship with all the same person with different faces is because there's something of this, all y'all, oh, there ain't no good men left in this world. I'm like, yeah, they are. They just ain't looking at you. <laughs> there's some great people in this world, but it's the law of draw. You know what I'm talking about? It's you will attract what you want when you get to that place where you are, where you're ready for it. And so we're going to talk about that, the anatomy of letting go. And so I titled my sermon today called Identity Crisis. Because what happens at a very young age, we begin, the, the enemy knows, go on and just go and set yourself up because in the next 30 minutes, you're going to walk out of here completely delivered. You don't stay broke on my watch. Okay, I, I got up at three o'clock in the morning to come hang with y'all because I love, I love me some no regrets. Now you make sure, listen, listen to me. I went to a counselor after I went to my divorce. I told this man every day for 17 years because I was broken. You got to start paying attention to patterns in your life. If you keep seeing that the men don't stay in your life or the women don't stay in your life and you keep seeing that in every situation in your life, you can't keep a job, you can't keep friends, you, you're sitting at home all the time by yourself. You don't know how to make friends very easily. You got to start asking yourself, why, what is it about me that is the common denominator? And it, I know it hurts. You know, we don't ever want to do that, especially if we were raised in a toxic family, man, where the dad was like, you ain't never going to mount to nothing. You're like, okay. <laughs> You know, and, you, and you're sitting here dealing with these generational curses in your life and you're owning these generational curses like you're going to win a reward for it. And you're walking through life, going to a counselor, going to Bertha every single week, spending $150 on counseling. And you're mad at her every week that you leave because you're still broke because we don't want to do our part. So today I want to give you some tools. Say, Kim, give me some tools. I'm going to give you some tools that's going to help you realize that you don't have to walk down the same path I walked down. Going to church, falling in the floor, going to these conferences, spending all this money and, and leaving the same way that we walked in because we are immune. We are used to the deprivation and pain. We're used to the breaking. We're used to the loneliness. We're, we're just now owning it and saying, this is the way it's gonna be forever. No, as long as you got a pulse, God's got a plan. As long as you ain't dead, God ain't done. And the wounds that are inside of you that you have covered for so long may not be your fault, but the healing is is your responsibility. And if you don't learn how to let go, you will go through life bleeding on people that didn't even cut you. 
And so you gotta love yourself enough to say today at No Regrets 2019, I'm about to get up and walk away from everything they said about me that was not of God, everything that people made me feel, the chaos, the confusion, the brokenness, I'm gonna leave it right here in this sanctuary and I'm gonna leave this place in peace because I choose to be whole. I choose to be healed. My scripture is Philippians 3, 13 through 14. This little stage makes me a little frightened. Y'all hear it queaking, squeaking. If I fall, y'all better not put it on social media. If I fall, y'all just act like it's part of me just falling and getting back up again. Because <laughs> I decide to let things go, okay? There's a funny video that's going around and it's this man, he's talking about the Holy Spirit moving and the words he's sitting there. And he's like, the Holy Spirit comes in and he just wrecks us. And right when he did that, he falls on the floor and the chair broke. I was like, I would have died. <laughs> But with social media, you know what I'm saying? So Philippians 3, 13 through 14, the Bible says, forgetting what is, come on readers, y'all read your Bibles. Come on. Forgetting what is and straining towards what is. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. It says, I'm not looking back no more. That even means the people that are in your life that keep reminding you of your past, you need to put them in your past. It's not saying that they're bad people. It's just saying that you are only connected to me through an outdated version. It's an expired version of who I am. We don't communicate the same anymore. I can't keep hanging out. We've been dating for five years and you keep saying you're going to put a ring on it and you ain't put no ring on it yet. I, I, I am, there is feeling, see the one thing I discovered about relationships, friendships, uh, boyfriend, girlfriend relationship is that when God is in it, it just works. We don't, it's not that complicated. That's why some of y'all are wasting all this time and you're going to send me emails when you hit about 50 years old and you're going to be mad at God because you're 50 and you ain't got no husband and you ain't got no babies. And you're going to be mad at God because, well, you, he said, well, he might have said it, but he can't force your tail to quit making everybody projects. Oh, Kurt, you got to help God, baby. I don't like the way my life is now, so I'm about to put some work in, right? I don't like being depressed every day. Y'all walk around with this depression on you like you're going to win a reward for, oh, Pastor Kim, don't go there. Don't go, you ever met the victim in their own stories? I can see their eyeballs. They, I can tell when they starting to get Satan coming in their eyeballs, looking at me. Like, girl, you better not mess with that. I'm like, oh, I'm coming straight for you. <laughs> I show sure well, because I love you enough that I know that if you listen to me, I'm not just telling you something I ain't walked through. But you will walk around with this depression like it's a clinical. Like, eat, oh, Pastor Kim, don't go there. It's clinical. And I'm like, well, how's that working for your mama? She like 600 pounds eating ho-hos, eating her emotions every day, angry at people that weren't even worth staying in her life. Depression's making you sit on the couch and eat bonbons and scratch her behind. And you're over here mad at God when God's over here saying, no, I need you to get up. I need you to get up and start realizing that rejection was not rejection. It was not, it was not because you had a five finger forehead and your thighs were too thick. Rejection was because where God's taken you, he says they can't go with you because you're wanting to stay right here, but I got something greater for you. Let them go, let it go. Bye. No, no, we don't fit no more. No, 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 I've outgrown you now. Every time you come in my presence, you take me back to a season in my life that I've outgrown and you can't. I would rather sit at home every day and watch no book that go out with you. All by myself. Some of y'all are scared to even go to Olive Garden and get you some breadsticks and, and, and Alfredo because you're like, oh, I can't go eat by myself. If I go eat by myself, it looks like I ain't lovable. You better learn how to enjoy your own self. You better learn how to let go. Stop listening to those voices on the inside of you that's told you you ain't good enough. Your thighs are too thick. Ain't no man gonna ever love you. That man used to love your thick thighs too. But see, the enemy knows that we all wanna be affirmed, validated, and loved. So you know what he does? He sends counterfeits into your life to tell you stuff that you know you needed validation in and they broke you down. Thick thighs ain't so bad. 
They've caught your phone from falling in the toilet a time or two. <laughs> what? Love yourself. Be yourself. And the right ones gonna come into your life. The right friends are gonna come into your life. The right jobs are gonna come in your life. The money's gonna come in your life. You ain't gonna be broke no more. Rejection was just a release. Rejection was just redirection. See, everybody wants to be a diamond, but nobody wants to get cut, man. And it's those seasons in your life. That, 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 that was one of these. God says, your ladder will be greater. He says, for I know the plans that I have for you, said the Lord, plans to bless you and not harm you, give you a future and hope. I laid in that bed for all those years. I told that man for 17 years, I was so broken, carrying baggage into my life, raised in a ministry that said, if you get divorced, you're going to hell on a slip and slide. Religion will have you tied, baby. You better shake it off and get your tail a religion, a relationship. And I laid in that bed broken in a million pieces saying, God, heal me. And I'll never forget God spoke to me. This was at 36 years old. And I know I look white on the outside, but I'm blacker than half of you on the inside. I'm black, but I crack. And when white people start hitting about 40, we start melting. And I told a man for 17 years, and I was turning 38 years old, I told him every day for 17 years, I don't need no man. Look, I used to could do that. I can't even do it no more. I got so delivered. I can, but see, I can't even do it. And I told him every day, I don't need no man. Because I was afraid that if a man ever thought I needed him because of the abandonment, because of the situations in my life that the enemy had put in my life to get me counterfeit, because he knew at 40 years old, I was going to have an awakening on the inside of me and I was going to find Jesus for myself. And that's when my life was going to really take off. So I just want to talk to somebody in this room today that feels like it's over. It's done. It ain't over. It's just beginning for you, baby. Your mind just needed to shift. I laid in that bed at 37, 38, and I kept telling God, God, this year, I got a flap right here. Every year I'd get another sag, and I ain't got no man. Cause I ran him off telling him, I don't need no man. And one day I woke up and didn't have one. And I was like, what happened? He said, you don't need no man. All of a sudden, I was like, oh, shoot. And God said, guess what? You created this storm. So you're going to use this storm for me to elevate you to where I want to take you. You're going to lose everything. Some of you in that season right now, you in your Bloomingdale season, baby. You got five degrees and can't even get a job because you're overqualified. Because God's saying, no, I need you right here. I need you to hit rock bottom so you can find out who the rock is at the bottom, which is Jesus. Stop needing people to validate you and validate yourself. I laid in that bed. I was like, God, take this pain away from me. I need you to take it away because now I'm 38. Every birthday I would tell him, I got another sag right here. What is this? The sag that comes is why we all start wearing long sleeve. And I realized that like 38 birthday, I was like, what is that? The only thing this is good for looks like a flat tire. The only thing it's good for is if I get an American flag tattooed on it, I can wave it on July the 4th. And God said, stop complaining, Kimberly, and get your heart right. I'm speaking to some people in this room today that have been mad at your daddy, mad at your ex, mad at your friend that betrayed you and telling you it ain't over. It starts today. My life starts today. Today we are going to talk about y'all laid in that bed and nobody talked to me like this. I wish I had the flowers and Dr. A over there. I can't say your last name right. Alatarn, turn. Ah, pretty good. When I first started, I was still at Bloomingdale's and he let me do a show with him or something. I did something with you. And now look, we doing the same thing with him. And he like a for real doctor. 
Yo, it's so funny. Listen to me. This is the cool thing about God and people. People will write you off and tell you, you can't tell me nothing. You went through a divorce. You can't tell, who are you to tell me? And I, I laugh so hard every day because God has such a sense of humor. Because I look at myself on all these flyers and I preach 51 weeks out of the year and pastor one of the greatest churches in America. And let me just tell you, most of the flowers, flyers, it's flyers, you know, the bulletin things. Most of those say relationship expert. <laughs> You know why? I can tell you how to run a man off and I can tell you how to keep a man. I learned how to stop nagging, man. When I want the trash, take it out. See, you learn. If you learn, you get better and not bitter. You get powerful, not pitiful. Now I know how to work my husband. What? I, just, I want the trash out. I walk in the kitchen. Baby, you are the sexiest trash can taker outer I've ever seen. <laughs> Because you know what I discovered? When God created Adam, he created Adam because he wanted to. When he created Eve, he created Eve because he had to. Because, baby, we produce power. A whole woman can make a poor man righteous. You got the power, queen. And all the men say, won't he do it? I rub that man's bald head. What? Hubba, 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 hubba. I ain't even got to nag him no more, man. I just love his lights out. I get whatever I want. <laughs> He's a good man. He's a good man. So I was laying in that bed and I was like, God, take this pain away from me. Just because I thought God was a genie in a bottle. And I just thought if I just prayed hard enough and fasted hard enough, that he was going to take the pain away from me. And he laid there. One night I was laying there just crying in my river, just crying in my milk because I didn't drink beer. And I was just sitting there crying, and I heard God say, Kimberly, I can't take it away. I can't take this pain away from you. I can't take this depression away from you. I can't take it. I can't. You're on Ambien and Xanax right now, and the only thing that's happening is you're blowing up and got back boobs. Because Xanax and, and Ambien, I'm, I, I'm not knocking anybody that's on it, because I was on it, and I was bigger than this room. And God said, because what's happening in society is making you get numb to what's really going on on the inside of you and you're not dealing with it. And I'm going to need you to get up and get, get, get up and walk away from it. Quit stalking them. Quit calling them. Quit stereo texting them. Quit looking. You didn't even like his mama. And the minute y'all got divorced, now y'all best friends. <laughs> you hated his mama. Now you get away from him and you're still calling her because you want to break your heart over and over. Not realizing that rejection, man, they took, when, when somebody walks out of your life, let them go. Your destiny is never tied to anybody that thinks you're trash. Well, Kim, you don't understand. We're in warfare. You've been dating him for 10 years. You done gave him the, the ding and you ain't got no ring. And you're over here like, Kim, you don't understand. It's warfare. I know he loves me. Girl, listen to me. When you're on the layaway plan... I sure do love y'all, man. Man, I love you. Today we're going to talk about letting go of anger, pain, past hurt, unmet expectation, past relationships and more. How do we let go? What does that really look like? Because it looks different for all of us, right? So we think. But did you know that we all are created in God? We've got the same power that raised Jesus from the dead living on the inside of us. And that means whenever we find ourselves in a storm that God already knew before we were ever there, we were going to face that heartbreak. And you know what he did? He said, when my mercy meets your mess, everything's going to change. Every storm you created, I'm going to use it for your future. I'm going to allow some oil to be dripping. Off. Some of you are wasting your oil because you're messing with people that you ain't assigned to. Y'all know what all is up in here? That's anointing. And you're wasting on people that ain't even worthy of it. How do we know it's time to let go? We've all been hurt. You can't be an adult, a teen alive today who hasn't experienced some kind of emotional pain. Rejection from your daddy. See, the enemy's a punk. He can't touch you. So where he gets you is six inches between your ears in distractions. And it usually looks like people. When God wants to bless you, he sends relationships. When the devil wants to mess with you, he sends relationships. 
That's why you got to know the difference. This is why you got to know who God is for yourself. Coming to know regrets is fine. But you better have a walk with God every day for your, and it ain't scrolling on Instagram, getting a meme, a breakthrough. Let me just, maybe Pastor Kim, maybe Real Talks Kim got something for me today. Yeah, I'm gonna have something for you. I sure am. But you gotta apply it. You can't continue to do the same things that you've done to get where you are and think something's gonna change. You got to wake up every day. I ain't got no prayer. Y'all laying in bed. Oh, Pastor Kim, real talk, Kim, pray for me. I can't even open my mouth. Bobby June walked out on me with my best friend. And I just want him back so bad. Now, did I tell you he's already got her pregnant? But I'm standing for my relationship. And I just, I don't think God hears me no more. Can you, you better learn how to open your mouth to pray over yourself. I ain't got nothing to pray. Turn on some worship music. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper. I got to, I got to. Before long, man, you're doing this. You can't even open your mouth. You got your body feels like it weighs a million pounds. All of a sudden, the more you start, waymaker. Because the Bible says that life and death on the power of whose words, baby? Poo, 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 poo. Your words. That's why you come to these conferences all you want, but until you know how to open your mouth and prophesy what God says instead of what you're looking at, you're going to stay right where you are, baby, stabilizing what he's trying to shake you free from, giving CPR to dead situations. Because you don't feel worthy of God's best. I'm here to talk to somebody this morning and tell you, you deserve the best. You are priceless. God created you. Fine, China. Stop letting people treat you like a paper plate. What do you do when all that hurt is probably more important than the hurt itself? Trying to make people pay. Can't forgive. You don't understand, Kim, what he did to me. It started at four years old when my uncle molested me and then my daddy walked out on me. I'd just been looking for love in all the wrong places. I know it probably hurt like hell to go through stuff like that in your life. But you got something on the inside of you now because you got stronger and you made it when other people would have given up. You got something on the inside of you now that you couldn't pay for, which is called passion, which is called passion. When you open your mouth like me, I got 200, 500 people in this room saying, yeah, I believe it. I'm done. Because it's a passion on the inside of you. That when you make it through something, you can look at little thumbnails all over social media and you can feel a connection with them because you made it through something and you ain't even got to go to college and get a degree. Because what you walk in, when you walk into a room like this, your mere presence changes the atmosphere. Because you made it. You made it. You're still here today. This is your wake up call. Clinical depression. The devil keeps telling you. Your whole family's had it. Can I tell you, the next time that punk is in your ear, he's such a punk. He's such a trick. He can't be at your house and mine. The devil can't be at your house and mine. He can't be messing with your kid and mine. He can't be messing with your man and mine. But we're giving him all this attention because we have lost our value. Next time he comes, you tell him, oh, it might be a part of my DNA. My mom might be cray cray and ran five men off with her big old mouth. It might be a part of my de depression, might be a part, but this is where it stops. You done ran into the wrong woman, baby, and you should have taken me out when you could have, because I'm about to get up from this wilderness and I'm about to get my bounce back. We walk around blaming others for our hurt. And that's what most of us do every day. Somebody did something wrong or they wronged us in some way that mattered to us. We want them to apologize. If I just knew what I did, I could fix it. Not realizing that sometimes you gotta be okay with an apology you never get. Because it was a release. God said rejection was not necessarily someone wanting out of your life, but it was somebody I needed out of your future. Stop trying to go back and right the wrongs. They're like Whitney Houston, let the wrongs be gone. Keep it moving. See, the problem with blaming others is that it can often leave you powerless. 
For example, you confront the person, your boss, your spouse, your parent, your child, and they say, no, I didn't. How's that make you feel? No, I didn't do that to you or worse. So what if I did do it? Because broken people break people. Hurt people hurt people. Love did not hurt you. Loving a person that didn't know how to love hurts you. Then you're left with all these anger, all this anger and hurt and no resolution. Broken in a million pieces. Because God was helping you get free. And he didn't even realize it. All your feelings are legitimate. You carry this even into your marriages. This is how come some of you have been married three and four times and you're embarrassed. You know why I talk about my divorces? Because number one, I did not go to hell on a slip and slide. Because God is a God of grace and mercy. And I realized that I drove that man off with my big old mouth because I could never shut up. I drove that dude to a full, he's still an alcoholic. Because a woman has that much power. For thir- now, I, I do think at some point he should have got up and started living again, but... Because it has been 13 years, but that ain't my fault. My fault ain't, I can't make him do it. See, we were both toxic for each other. And instead of depending on that toxicity, I got up and started getting better. And I started saying, I'm going to tell everything. I, every, y'all know everything about me. That's why when people say something about me, y'all are like, duh. She ain't been married once. She was married twice. Because I tell everything. I was married twice before I was 20, y'all. Not one person in my family has ever been married, but once. But the enemy knew, just like he knew, I came to a conference like this. And I sat in that chair, and I had an awakening of, oh, ah, see? Devil, you weren't never fighting me because I was weak. Because thieves don't rob empty vaults. There's something on the inside of me that I'm about to figure out. Y'all, in the last five years... In the last five years, I got to leave Bloomingdale's. I was in special ed my whole life. I still don't know where a hooked on phonics is. (laughs) In the last five years, I've gone full-time ministry. Because of my fruit, God's trusted me. Because what you see is what you get. Because whenever, I, I used to hate people. And now God's given me such a love for people that I can look at little bitty thumbnails and I can literally love you so hard that I say, man, I love you. And y'all like, girl, I know you do. Let's go. (laughs) That's what is produced in your brokenness. So how are you going to let go of the past hurts? And if God did it for me, I don't think that God brings people up. I know that Isaac Curry did not just sit and think of of, of, of speakers and throw them up there. I I know he's prayed. And God brought up all of us speakers that God has done magnificent things that only God can do and only God can get the credit. And so God's not gonna let me come standing, uh, stand up here and tell you that he's done it for me in five years. I'm from Fayetteville, Georgia with the cows. I did not have anybody hand me anything. If God did it for me in five years, imagine what he's gonna do for you in two. Because what he does is he brings people in your life to inspire you and say, if God did it for her, he's going to do it for me. So God, what you did for her in five years, I want you to do it for me in two. I've written five bestsellers. I am in y'all Barnes and Noble. (laughs) Hooked on phonics ain't in me. You do what you believe you can do. So how are you going to let go of the past hurts? so that you can walk in this in two years. God brought me this bow chicka wow wow that's sexy and sweet. I've been married to him for seven. And if he ever packs his bags, I'm packing mine and going with him. Cause when God does a work on you, baby, what, what, what? So how are you gonna do it? How are you gonna let go? Right now, write this down. It's easy. You make a decision. I'm making a decision to let it go. Things don't disappear on their own. You need to make the commitment to let it go. 
If you don't make this conscious choice up front, you could end up self-sabotaging any effort to move on from past hurt. And you're going to be mad at yourself in 10 years when you're still staring at the same mountain saying, I'm waiting on God. And God's over saying, I'm waiting on you. The next thing you got to do is express your pain and your responsibility. I wanted relationships so bad that I just settled for the same person with different faces. They're giving my time back there, so I'm doing it. <laughs> the next thing you've got to do is stop being the victim. Come on, tell yourself that right now. Stop being the victim. Stop being a victim in your own story. Stop putting unfair expectations on people in your life. It's not their place to fix you. You want to wake up every day and have joy unspeakable and full of glory. You want to look in that mirror every day and say, girl, let's do this. I, 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 I can't touch it. Nah. <laughs> then you got to focus on the present, the here and now, and the joy. Stop thinking that your best is back there. Your best is in front of you, baby. Because you serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You serve. Listen to me. I, I, let me close with this right here. Some of y'all struggling in your life with people that have walked out on your life. One of the most valuable lessons I learned in life, and it shifts, is that God connects you with people who understand you're not yet. There are tons of folks in this life who embrace and affirm you where you are now. Because where you are now does not intimidate them or make a demand on them to change the dynamics of who they are. They are content where you are and where they are in the relationship. What you will discover, what you will discover is that once God shifts you into your not yet, some will have difficulty adapting. For some, it will, be, it will bring out negative feelings about you that they have suppressed. For others, it will be a reevaluation of their own inability to go where God has taken you. You cannot lose sleep when this happens. I was so deeply concerned when I started realizing that I was going to another level and, and, and losing some of my people I thought were ride or dies in my life. So I attempted to reach out to many people who were in, the, in a relationship with me, but left once I accepted the call of God on my life. I accepted the call to get better, not bitter. I accepted the call to not sit in Starbucks with them and talk about everybody in the world with them. I wanted the families because it felt safe. I wanted the friendships because it felt safe. It was then that I was reminded of this story. When a space shuttle flew into outer space, it was launched with enough energy and fuel to get it to its destination. There were two rockets boosters on the side of the shuttle, which were designed to fall off at a certain altitude. There was no system failure with the shuttle or with the boosters. They were engineered to respond this way. Their job was to boost the shuttle to a certain altitude and then fall away so the shuttle could continue into orbit. If they remained beyond their designed altitude, it would create a drag on the shuttle and prevent it from reaching its destination. When you are chosen to do great things and everybody in this room is because this was a divine appointment for you. When you are chosen to do great things by God, some people in your life, are designed to fall out at a certain altitude. It doesn't mean that you are bad or that they are bad. It just, is, it just reveals the fact that they were not designed to fly into your orbit. I love you! Thank you so much.